In keeping with what I announced at the end of our worship period this morning, we want to begin then this afternoon a general study of the Holy Spirit, not only to get ready for and I hope better appreciate what the lectureship is about, but also just to make sure that we understand what the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, has taught us, Ephesians 6, 17. So I want to begin with the personality and the deity of the Holy Spirit. Two views have been entertained concerning the Holy Spirit. The first one, probably to one extent or the other, predominates among those believing in the Holy Spirit as to how they view His personality and divinity. And that is that it, and I deliberately use that, it, is a divine influence proceeding from the Father, an emanation from or a manifestation of the divine or a mere impersonal force. Not all who are in error on the plan of salvation, what the church is, so forth, would believe that, but a great many do. And as I say, they will carry that uh, to one extent or the other according to whatever doctrine they believe that makes them what they are. The second one is that he... And I deliberately use the word, the word he, masculine pronoun, is a person. And he is active in all the ways of a personality. Now that the latter view, the second view, is the correct and scriptural one, I hope to prove by the following considerations or the scriptures that we should consider. And first of all, I want you to notice that the works of the Holy Spirit proclaim His personality. Now this is going to be a study that will generally show the person that the Holy Spirit is a person. That He's a divine person. But it will be mainly by just considering one scripture right after the other. So you might want to perk your ears up if you're going to take notes and get ready to write them down. First of all, his works proclaim his personality. Notice that Paul said to the young preacher Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in a latter time some shall depart from the faith. Well, a speaker is a person, not just an influence or a principle speaking. But we notice also that the Holy Spirit gives testimony. He testifies. We learn from John 15, 16, and in that passage, Jesus is speaking about his departure. Going back to heaven following his resurrection. And the Holy Spirit's work peculiarly and specially with the apostles to enable them to be the ambassadors of the court of heaven, which we've many, mentioned many times over the last few weeks in our study of of the word of reconciliation. And notice what Jesus said about him. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, now watch it, he shall bear witness of me. Now that's a sign of a person, folks. John 15, 26. I learn in that same context only, a context, only a chapter earlier, where he's still talking about that same relationship the Spirit would have with the apostles after he was no longer with them, that the Holy Spirit teaches and quickens or makes alive the mind. Jesus said in John 14, 26, But the Comforter, even the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all that I said unto you. Again, going to the 16th chapter of the book of John in verses 12 and 13. Again, Jesus speaking. John, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, by the way. 
writes down what Jesus said concerning the Holy Spirit's work with the apostles. He says, Jesus, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you can't bear them now. How be it? When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he shall guide you into all truth. Now let me pause here and say this on these passages. There's a lot more truth taught there, but we're just emphasizing the idea that the Holy Spirit is a person and is a divine person. We also notice from Luke's writing in Luke uh, Acts 16 that the Holy Spirit leads and uh, prohibits or forbids. Scripture reads, as Luke records this part of the history of the church, and they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they were come over against Mysia, that is say, they essayed to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus suffered them not. Now you say, well, that's the Spirit of Jesus, not the Holy Spirit. What do you think the Spirit of Jesus is? So it needs to be understood that when you see these words used by the Spirit Himself in writing the Bible, He will many times make reference and use interchangeably these different words. How did we get, and I'm speaking now specifically, the New Testament of Jesus Christ? First of all, God, in whom all authority inheres, delegated authority to Jesus Christ because of what Jesus became and did. But it was Jesus who tells the apostles of Jesus Christ, that He will send them the Holy Spirit. And you'll notice in these passages earlier that the emphasis on the Spirit's work was that He is a revealer of truth. And thus we receive the New Testament of Christ from the Father through the Son via the medium of the Holy Spirit through the instrumentation of the truth. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. It is the instrument the Spirit uses to convict people of sin and convert them to Christ. And to keep them faithful to God. We need to understand that. Yet it's the New Testament of the Christ. But it's the sword of the Spirit. Now that doesn't have a direct bearing on proving the personality and divinity of the Spirit. But it shows you some of the things here that can also be noted. About the work of the Spirit. Through his sword. His instrument. Which is the word of God. But we also learn from the scriptures. As Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10. That the. The Spirit is revealed as one who searches. But unto us God revealed them through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Again, all of these things have to do with things said of a person, not an it or an influence. So let's sum up what we've said thus far. In these passages, the Holy Spirit is said to speak. He's said to testify. He's said to uh, guide. He's said to quicken. He is said to lead. He is said to forbid or prohibit. Or he, and he's also said to search. Again, all these things combined. To show that the Holy Spirit is a person and not just a mere influence of deity. For nothing but a person can do these things. Well, let's go further. The Holy Spirit has the characteristics of a person. So let's mention a few of them. I learned from Paul's writing to the church at Rome about the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8 and verse 27. And he that searches, we've already seen that he searches, you see. And he that searches the mind knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. That needs to be kept in mind. Romans 8, 27. In 1 Corinthians 2, 11, even the things of God none knoweth, save the Spirit of God. I learned too that Affection is ascribed to the person of the Spirit. Romans 15 and verse 30. Paul writes, Now I beseech you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the love of the Spirit, 
that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. I turn on to Paul's writing to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. And the scripture says, But all these worketh the one and the same Spirit, dividing to each one severally as he will. And that's speaking of the Spirit in the giving of miraculous gifts. In the Old Testament, in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 9, in verse 20, I find that thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them. So the Spirit's called good, and he's mentioned there is one who instructs. I think we've seen from our scripture so far, he instructs through the word of truth. Well, now, what, what, what we got here, we talk about the putting together all the material we have on a matter before we try to reason with it and draw a conclusion, we notice that goodness, that will, that affection, that knowledge, and mind are all characteristics of not an influence, but of a person. And by no stretch of the imagination can they be ascribed to a mere impersonal influence or principle. So these five characteristics form the we can call it this, the very fingers in the hand of certainty by which we grasp the personality of the Spirit. But that's not all. I also learned from a study of the Scriptures that the Holy Spirit suffers slights and injuries that can only be ascribed to a person. In Ephesians 4 and verse 30, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. Of course, we all know in these letters of the New Testament, he's writing that, the New Testament of the Christ. It says that he, the Spirit, can be grieved and vexed. Paul said, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, in whom ye were sealed unto the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30. But then in Isaiah in the Old Testament, sometimes people think that in the Old Testament they didn't have a, a fundamental understanding of the, of the Holy Spirit. That's just not the case. The great prophet Isaiah penned, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy, and himself fought against them, speaking of rebellious Israel. I find, too, that the Holy Spirit can be despited or despised. In Hebrews 10, 29, remember he writes to a bunch of Jewish Christians who due to persecution are actually thinking about giving up the whole New Testament system. And he writes to them and says of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall he be judged worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, now listen, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Hebrews 10, 29. If I depart from the faith, the system that is the New Testament system, I am pictured as uh, doing despite to the Holy Spirit. You can't say that about a Sears catalog. <laughs> you can't say that by mere impersonal force. You can say that about a person. I learned, too, that the Holy Spirit can be spoken against, that he can be blasphemed. Jesus, in John, or rather Matthew, chapter 12, verses 31-32, Therefore, Matthew records, I, Jesus, say unto you, Every sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy of the Spirit shall not be forgiven. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever shall speak against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this world or age, nor in that which is to come, the age or world to come. Now, we are not to try to get into a discussion right now about what is blasphemy with the Holy Spirit. The point we're just making is that when Jesus said this, one could speak against the Holy Spirit, a person. I learned, too, from Acts 7 and verse 51, as Luke records the sermon of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. And what he says here is one reason he got stoned. I learned that the Holy Spirit can be resisted. Stephen said, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. 
you do always resist the Holy Spirit. I see too, by the sins of the brethren, two brethren, in the early church, in fact, it's the first sin mentioned in the early church, that of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5 and verse 3. Peter, inspired of the Holy Spirit, as an apostle of the Christ, said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? So a mere principle cannot sustain any of these slights that we've noticed that are said that are against the Spirit. Nothing but a personality can be blasphemed, lied to, resisted, or grieved. So he is a divine person. And this will be seen from the study of the scriptures regarding, regarding his divine attributes. Because you're going to see if they're divine attributes, that means they are the attributes of God. In fact, in Acts 5 there, you will see that the word God and uh, Holy Spirit are used interchangeably as to who Ananias and Sapphira agreed to lie to. Notice this, Hebrews 9.14 how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish unto God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hebrews 9.14 But again, the Lord is great in Zion, from the psalmist, Psalm 99.2, and He is high above all the people. Then there is omniscience. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11, where he's talking about how we got the mind of God given to us regarding how God saves us. But unto us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. That's because He is God, you see. For who among men knoweth the things of a man? And man, of course, are persons. Of the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Listen, watch his reasoning. Even so the things of God none knoweth, save the spirit of God. Now that tells you why he can reveal the mind of God. Because he is deity. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. But also, he is omnipotent. In Micah 3, 8 the prophet said, But as for me... I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Well, that's eternity. That is, he inhabits eternity. Uh, that's omniscience. He knows all that the object of knowledge. That's omnipotence. He's all-powerful. Now, what about omnipresence? Well, notice Psalm 139, verse 7, and then we'll note verse 10. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Even there shall they, thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. But that's not all that is said in the Old Testament. The weeping prophet Jeremiah had these things to say from Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 24. Can any hide himself in secret places so that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. Again, that's Jeremiah 23, 4. Well, we also want to emphasize that the very works that the third person of the great Godhead does manifests his deity. Remember his involvement, his work in the creation of the world. The scripture reads, as Moses inspired of that spirit records in Genesis 1 and 2, and the earth was waste and void, as one version says, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. Let's add a little more to that from later in the Old Testament. In the book of Job, Job 26 and verse 13. By His Spirit are the heavens garnished. His hand 
hath pierced the swift serpent. Back to the psalmist. Psalm 33 and verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. And all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. We'll go back to Job with me again. Job 33 and verse 4. Regarding the same thing. The works of the Spirit manifest his deity and his personality. The Spirit of God hath made me. And the breath of the Almighty giveth me life. Again, Job 33, 4. It's important to understand in studying anything, especially one like this, doesn't get studied that much, there's so much error on it, that there are words that are used interchangeably. We all know that the first person of the Godhead, who we know is the Heavenly Father, the second person of the Godhead, the Word, the Eternal Word, who became Jesus Christ, who dwelt among men because he became man. John 1, 1 and 2 and verse 14. And then the Holy Spirit. All were active in the material creation. You learn from Colossians, other places, that Jesus, being the second person, was the executor of the Father's will. The Father had in his mind what he wanted done, and the second person carried it out, and the third person formed and arranged it. Now if you look at the spiritual creation of the church, you'll see the same thing. It was in the Father's mind as to how He would save man. Jesus executed the plan and the Holy Spirit formed the whole thing. And that we don't many times study, but I urge you to spend more time in the study of it to understand the work of each person of the great Godhead in our redemption. Jesus became, or he who was or is, the second person of the Godhead. It was his responsibility to become man. It wasn't the first person nor the third person. That's why the second person, who is always pictured as the executor of the Father's will, did what he did. But the Holy Spirit is always pictured as the revealer and the confirmer and the arranger. And if you'll study through, I guarantee you, you will never see that deviated from in the whole Bible, whether it's material creation or the spiritual creation. That's why the New Testament is the New Testament of the Christ, but it's the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 17. There are also the works of providence. Providence has always intrigued me because it reveals as much as anything the great glory of God and that He is sovereign in control of everything. Yet it still allows for the individual will of man to function and yet, at the end of all things, it'll all work out like God said. Now, if you have all that figured out, well, you don't. <laughs> it's just all there is to it. You just don't know the mechanics of it. Yet, the Bible makes it clear that God does. You know, I'm thankful, and I wish we would think more about this. I'm thankful. I don't have to be concerned about all that. God says, you have one duty. Take me at my word. And he proves to us adequately that it, the Bible is his word. And if I will do these things, he'll take care of everything else I can't do. Now, is that unusual? I want you to think these babies in here. I want to know how much. Mark, how much is, is Grayson concerned about you going to work tomorrow? You are, aren't you? And your wife is. And you're concerned about what? You do so you can provide for provide pro provident that you'll provide for Grayson. Do you think he's concerned about that? Do you hear him? <laughs> Whoever that is. Well, I, I'm glad things are like that because they help me, as the human I am, to understand my heavenly Father, and I, His family, the church can be taken care of. And I have but one simple duty. God has a hard part, by the way, if you look at it from man's standpoint. We just simply have to take Him at His word, do our best to know it, bring our life and subject it to it. And He's going to take care of all this. All because He's God and He knows what He's doing. And He can do it. So there's the work of providence. God's provision. Psalm 104.30 Listen. Thou sendest thy spirit. They are created. And thou renewest the face of the ground. Now that means that God via the work of the Spirit 
through all these natural laws that were spoken into existence and are sustained by the word of his power, all of it is involved. Don't, aren't you just glad you don't have to be that concerned about that? Tell me when you, when you take a seed, all other things being equal, and you place it in the warm ground, tell me about that life germ that's in it. Man ever figured it out? Tell me why it sprouts and it grows. Who caused that? Who made that? Well, God did. And I don't even have to be that concerned about it. I just have to do my part. I have to get the ground ready. If there's fertilizer involved in it. There's working the thing. That's fine. But God's going to make the thing grow. And that's all in His hands. And we don't think a thing about it. We just are concerned about doing our part, preparing the ground and so forth. Well, what about the work of regeneration as it has to do with making me a Christian? I'm dead in trespasses and sins. All of sin that comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. The wages of sin is death. Separation from God, Romans 6.23. And that's the state I'm in in my alien sins. The sins that I first committed and alienated me from God. That's what we mean by an alien sinner. How am I going to be made alive spiritually? How can I be regenerated? Well, it's because of what Jesus did that makes it possible for me to have faith in Him based on His Word and be saved by Him. The work of regeneration and resurrection. Jesus answered, verily, which means it's the truth, it's the fact. It's the same Greek word by which we say amen when we mean so be it to what was just said. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Nicodemus is who he's speaking to, except... And the force of accept there is if and only if you do what I'm going to say. It's not going to happen otherwise. That's the force of the acceptive clause. Except one be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's pretty plain, isn't it? You're not going to be regenerated unless you're born of the Spirit. You just can't be. Born of water and the Spirit. Well, how am I born of water and the Spirit? The Spirit in His Word tells me that I must be baptized to be saved. Preceding that, I must be brought to belief in Christ. I must comply with the mandate of Acts 17.30 to repent of my sins and of Romans 10.10 10 to confess my faith in the Christ, even as we studied this morning in the sermon. I must state my creed. Now I'm qualified before God to be baptized. And when I comply with the sword of the Spirit, I'm raised to walk in newness of life. I'm regenerated thereby because I've contacted the blood of Christ when I was buried, baptized into the death of Christ. And I am made a, a, a Christian. I am regenerated by the Spirit. But it wasn't raw spirit upon me. It was the Spirit through the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God that instructs me that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And that's in John 3 and verse 5. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead shall give life also to your mortal bodies through His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Romans 8, 11. The great Spirit of God via the instrumentality of His sword impacts me, reaches me, guides me. But not against my will and against my ability to learn. I've got to be willing to listen. I've got to be willing to do what's necessary to learn. I've got to be led by the Spirit. It's not some sort of thing that comes out of the... You notice how buddy looked and announced what I was going to do tonight when he said preach on the Spirit? And that's the way most people think of it. Not a very logical thing. The Spirit's revealed the mind of Christ on my level of intellectual, rational understanding. I study the Bible, write by the word of truth, I understand the will of God, and I obey the truth. The Spirit saved me. So did the Father. And so did the Son. It is the Son's will that's revealed by the Holy Spirit in the words of Christ. Thus, when I preach the word, I preach that which is necessary for one to build faith in Jesus Christ. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I learned too as we close the lesson that he's the source of all that is miraculous. Now you have the word miraculous modern, in modern day terms used to mean uh, antibiotics and things like that and they're called miracle drugs or somebody's in a car that gets uh, 
mashed flat, and it looks like how in the world anybody get out of it, and then the news says, well, not a scratch on the person, that was a miraculous thing. Well, that's not the biblical use of the word miracle. A miracle, according to the Bible, is where the natural laws are set aside, and things happen that men cannot do, nor do the natural laws allow for. That's a miracle. And thus you have people lame from their mother's womb and grown men and by the word of the Lord or by the word of the apostles they walk again as if they'd never been crippled. Or you have Lazarus in the tomb already decayed and just by the power of the word of Jesus Christ Lazarus come forth. That's all it took. And he's resurrected. And that gives us great hope, beloved. Someday that sound will come out of heaven as God sends forth His Son to bring His children home. And all that are in the grave shall hear His voice and shall come forth. They that have done good in the resurrection of life, they that have done evil in the resurrection of damnation. But it will be the Lord's voice pronouncing the words. In other words, His will has to be manifest somewhere. Somebody said, well, when you get to heaven glorified and everything's changed as it is here, what kind of language do we speak? Well, just be faithful here and get there and find out. Those things don't concern me one little bit. What concerns me is am I faithful to my God now in the church and am I being what all He wants me to be as the New Testament, the Spirit reveals I should be. So, but if I, by the Spirit of God, Jesus said, cast out devils, then is the kingdom of God come upon you. Matthew 12, 28. Well, I thought Jesus by His own person, being that He is the second person of the Godhead, He's deity, I thought He could cast out on His own. Why? By the Spirit. You know, this tells us something about what Christ divested Himself of in becoming a man. That's why the Scripture says that the Lord, Jesus, was given by His Father the Spirit with out measure. You see, he could draw on the Spirit as he needed to, but he had to be a man like you and like me. And he overcame sin as a man. But he had to work miracles. But he's divested himself of those things. Well, then how does he work a miracle? He received the Spirit without limit. And thus he drew on the Spirit. And what does he say right here? How do I cast these devils out of these people? By the Spirit of God. And that's exactly how he did it. To another, as we find how the miraculous gifts got into the church and what they did, notice, to another, faith in the same Spirit. In other words, regardless of the different gifts you have, uh, who's the source of it? Why, it's the Spirit. To another, faith in the same Spirit. And to another, gifts of healing in the one Spirit. But all these work the one and the same Spirit, dividing to each one severally, even as He will. In other words, as it was necessary, 1 Corinthians 12, 9 and 11, for them to have what they had to have in view of the fact they didn't have the New Testament so they could be what they ought to be. That's exactly what the miraculous works did. Well, I won't try to go back over this, but if you've taken notes, you see that when you put all this together and you still want to say, well, I don't think the Spirit's a person, you've got to find all of what the Spirit had recorded by Himself. I think He knows what He is. <laughs> And we've been reading from His Word. And He said, here's what I am. Now what would you think if a buddy got up and says, I want to tell you what happened in my life this morning. And He gets through going through this interesting whatever it may have been. And He gives you the details of the facts in the case. And you say, I don't believe it. Well, if you don't believe what He said happened in His own life, where are you going to go to find out what happened in His own life? Now, I know what you're thinking. The buddy is too. You go to Burnell and get the facts. Well, don't carry illustrations further than what it's meant to illustrate. And that is also a good rule of Bible study when you're reading the Scriptures. Things were set out. Just, <laughs> I've thought of this something. It, it often happens. But a fellow was uh, preaching every sermon on baptism. And he'd done it for months. People said, well, we look like to know a little bit about something else. So they said, we want you to, to preach on some other topic. said, you've been preaching good sermons on that, and we don't deny it, but we want to hear something else. So he got up and he said, we will, uh, we will now have our study of a pearl of great price. And he said, and everybody knows where a pearl is formed. A pearl is formed in an oyster due to a little grain of sand irritating it. And everybody knows where 
and oyster is. It's in the water, and now we'll discuss baptism. <laughs> well, that doesn't quite get around to what they wanted him to do. But nevertheless, if we can't depend upon ad adequate evidence and credible testimony from the very people involved, or in this case, deity involved, let me tell you how you go. How are you going to find out about anything? How are you going to learn about it? How are you going to know anything? You won't. You, people will say, well, I'm not going to believe anything I cannot personally be involved in an experience. You won't believe much. Because a whole lot of what we believe is based upon what somebody told us. In fact, we like to believe some things so well, we don't really care whether they're credible witnesses. It suited our purpose to hear it, and we're glad to tell it. Wow, that's something to say about tailbearing. It's not good. So we must receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, which is the seed of the kingdom, which was given to direct, lead, and guide us and enlighten us. And that's how the Spirit works. But in learning those things, we learn about the Spirit himself, that he's not an it or a thing or a manifestation or an emanation or just a fluid, an influence. But the Spirit is the third person of the great Godhead who speaks to us through the word of truth because he revealed it. And he gives us the will of our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation to become a Christian, you'll become a Christian if you follow the sword of the Spirit, the instrument the Spirit uses, which is the Word of God, to believe that Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of sins. Then you'll be a Christian. As a child of God, are you following the Spirit's instructions to live the Christian life faithfully? If you haven't, you need to repent of those sins. Come confessing them and pray God for forgiveness, for that's God's great second law of pardon. Are you subject to his invitation to obey the truth or to renew things in your life? If you are, we invite you to come while we stand and sing this song.